My name's Brandon and this is Nickelodeon Video Game History, a show where I take a look back on all of the video games based on Nickelodeon shows and retrospectively review them. Poor old Jimmy Neutron has had a rough time in the video game space so far. The games based on the movie were big disappointments, while Jimmy Negatron was almost a candidate for being a so bad it's good game. The series is ripe for video game adaptations with Jimmy's endless stream of new gadgets, so it's impressive that the current efforts have been so lackluster. Today we're looking at both a handheld and home console entry into the series with Jimmy Neutron Jet Fusion. Released on September 16, 2003 for home consoles and September 24 for the GBA, Jet Fusion was inspired by the two-part episode Operation Rescue Jet Fusion from Season 2. A lot of sources say these games are direct adaptations of those episodes, but from what I can tell that's incorrect. While they're definitely inspired by the basic ideas, the actual plot is completely unique. The home console version was developed by Australian developer Chrome Studios. Founded in 1999, they were best known for their work on The Legend of Spyro and New Beginning, and for bringing an Australian flair to the mascot platformer genre with Ty the Tasmanian Tiger. Jet Fusion would be their one and only Nick game. On the handheld side, Helix were back yet again. They've developed Wild Thornberry's Chimp Chase, Rocket Power Dream Scheme, and Beach Bandits. The first two GBA TAC games and the GBA Break Into Rules are still to come as well. Honestly, their two Rocket Power games were pretty good, so I have high hopes that the handheld version will at least be bearable. Critics weren't exactly kind to it though, giving it just a 5.7 average review score. The home console version was all over the place with its scores. The GameCube version had a 6.3, but the PS2 version only had a 5. For me, I'm just hoping these games aren't as bad as the sloppy Jimmy Neutron games we've already received. As I mentioned, Jet Fusion is inspired by the titular character's appearance in a Season 2 double part episode. Who's Jet Fusion? Well, he's basically a James Bond parody. Jimmy is obsessed with the character and attempts to bring his stories to life via a new invention. Naturally, this goes all wrong and it sucks Jimmy's class inside the book. To deal with all of this, Jimmy is going to have to fight through a side-scrolling action platformer. The game has a heavy emphasis on action. You're almost always shooting at enemies, with the platforming never really getting too difficult. Despite where Helix has placed the emphasis for the gameplay, it controls really well in both aspects. Platforming is solid and feels really tight, especially when the jumps you're doing aren't insane, while the gunplay is decent enough. When Jimmy is sucked into the Jet Fusion story, his hero shows up and immediately gives a literal child access to a gun. This is your primary weapon for the opening stages of the game. You press B to fire, and holding the button down allows Jimmy to infinitely fire. There's actually no drawback to doing this, so I played probably 90% of the game with the B button held down. Eventually, as you progress deeper into the game, you obtain new weapons, like the grenades, allowing you to switch on the fly depending on the situation or the enemies being faced. Sometimes these weapons double as a traversal or puzzle-solving tool. You'll get guns that shoot water or gum, both of which are required to move past certain obstacles. In addition to this, there are plenty of upgrades scattered about that increase the power of your weapons and give nice little tweaks to their basic abilities. One upgrade to the standard ray gun gave it a rebound effect that was very handy. All of these are completely optional and pretty easy to miss if you aren't constantly paying attention to your map. Similarly, you'll find upgrades to your max health. These upgrades are always off the beaten path and are much tougher than the standard A to B gameplay, but it's always worth it in the end. Jet Fusion on the GBA is divided into different hub worlds. Jimmy will arrive in a newly themed environment, with several levels available to him. The goal of each area is to grab a part from each individual level, which will form an invention that allows Jimmy to remove a roadblock, preventing him from going to the next area. A lot of these inventions tie into Goddard. You'll be using him to jump over long gaps or traverse underwater. It's a nice use of Jimmy's robot dog and also acts as some extra spice to the gameplay. Combat starts off ridiculously easy. All enemies just run straight at you, meaning you'll dispatch them without even having to think. Eventually enemies do evolve and have some unique movement patterns, 
but the game takes a little too long to introduce this. You'll definitely be a little bored of enemies just sprinting directly into your gunfire before it attempts something different. Once it does get a little more adventurous with enemies, you'll be far more engaged. Astute players will probably notice that most enemy types across different environments are basically just reskins, but I think they did a good enough job tweaking them so that it's not too samey. I was honestly really impressed by how well designed the combat was. I absolutely despised these bird enemies that dropped crabs. Without fail, they'd almost always damage me no matter how prepared I was for them. Usually an enemy like this would frustrate the hell out of me, but Helix made these birds extremely likely to drop health pickups. It feels like a perfect balance. These crafty birds will be a real nemesis, but the health pickups ensure you never get completely frustrated trying to deal with them. I think my biggest issue with Jet Fusion's combat is the way difficulty is handled. To ramp things up, Helix simply decided to spam more and more enemies at the one time. It feels like such a cop-out way to make things tougher. I would have much rather seen enemies taking damage or using unique movement patterns rather than just dropping a million enemies on screen. In stark contrast to this is the way they make you utilize every weapon at your disposal come the final levels. For the majority of the game I was just using the regular blaster and having no issues, but when you get down to the climax you'll find yourself digging deep into your arsenal to deal with enemies more effectively. It's really well done, and while I thought the final level was a bit hit and miss with throwing excessive amounts of enemies at you to the point where the game stops being much fun, I did like this aspect. And when I died, I really enjoyed the way the game handled checkpointing. Dying will send you back to your last checkpoint. These are nicely spaced out in levels, so you never lose an insane amount of progress. On top of that, Jet Fusion has quite possibly the most extensive password system I've seen. Not only do you get passwords for beating levels and moving to new hub worlds, but the game gives you a password for every checkpoint. At a glance, that might seem like overkill, but personally, I think that this is an amazing quality of life addition. Handheld platforms are all about playing on the go, so anything that makes it possible to have seamless short burst gameplay sessions is a big tick in my book. Each area of Jet Fusion has a distinct theme, keeping your adventure fresh from start to finish. The best part though is how every level flows almost perfectly. Levels have been meticulously put together with your path to the end goal feeling so natural. Even the optional areas to nab upgrades link in perfectly with the main path. Once you play through each level in an area and grab all of the invention parts, you get to have an obligatory boss battle. These are with Jimmy's friends who have been brainwashed into being the main villain's henchmen, but before you can get to them you have to play through a minigame. I found each minigame quite unspectacular. The bar is set incredibly low with the first area where you have to play Pachinko. The goal is to get a score of 25,000 which takes an eternity. You can't lose or anything, you just simply sit there like a fucking gambling addict trying to run up the score. Thankfully I could speed this up via my emulator. Basically all of these mini games are way too long, culminating in the jetpack section before the final boss battle that just never ends. Some of you with a keen eye may have noticed that a lot of the gameplay and systems in Jet Fusion is reminiscent of a Metroidvania. While I wouldn't say it's a pure Metroidvania, it feels pretty clear to me that Helix has taken massive inspiration from that genre, but tweaked it for a younger audience. It gives off big, baby's first Metroidvania vibes. The way levels are designed, the constant addition of new gear helping you open up new paths, at the heart of it all, it feels like it belongs to that genre. Those games are often known for their tendency to just leave the player in the dark, requiring you to piece together what the hell you're supposed to do and where you're supposed to go next. For fans of the genre, this is exactly what they want out of a Metroidvania, but for younger players, this can be a big hurdle and a big turnoff. Thankfully, Helix understood its target audience perfectly, helping guide the player along their journey. Older players will definitely argue it's too handholdy, but taking into account who this game was made for, I think it's really well done. Jet Fusion feels like a gateway drug to other Metroidvanias, in the same way Pokemon acts as an introduction to more complex RPGs. As I've said constantly, I wish these licensed games would lean more heavily into playing around with unique genres and gameplay styles like this. Most titles just settle for being a basic 2D or 3D platformer, 
but almost always the games that stick in my mind well after I finish them are the ones that experiment with different genres. Whether they fail or succeed in bringing that genre to a licensed title, I'm certainly going to remember the experience a lot longer than generic platformer 254. The icing on the cake for Jet Fusion is the visuals. Prior to this release, Humansoft were the only developers who had got their hands on Jimmy Neutron in the handheld space. In previous reviews of their games, not only have they proven to be awful when it comes to gameplay, but their visuals were ghastly. In comparison, the visuals for Jet Fusion are gorgeous. The characters aren't just blobs of pixels, and the environments are all brought to life brilliantly. It's honestly the first time I've been really satisfied with a Nick handheld game graphically since Software Creation stopped developing Rugrats games. Helix have really earned my respect after a very rocky start with Chimp Chase. They got super unique with their ideas for the two Rocket Power games they developed, and with Jet Fusion, it's clear they gave great care and respect to the IP. They worked their asses off to create something that felt like both a great Jimmy Neutron game, as well as a great game in general. Their ability to be creative and bold enough to take on genres not usually seen in licensed games should be commended. When you've got developers completely phoning in most of these Nick games, particularly on the handheld side of things, their hard work stands out even more. I feel like I've barely said this lately, but I definitely recommend you check out Jet Fusion on the GBA. However, that's just the beginning. Jet Fusion's flashy home console version is up next. Will Chrome Studios impress just as much? I'm going to create a virtual world reproduction machine so I can show my Jet Fusion book to the class as a holographic movie. Jet Fusion's home console version uses the exact same story premise as the GBA's. Once again, Jimmy makes a ridiculous invention that sucks the town into a Jet Fusion story and you're tasked with playing through a bunch of different locations to stop Jet Fusion's arch nemesis. Obviously the game differs quite dramatically when it comes to the gameplay. Although a Jimmy Neutron game on the GameCube that copied the Metroid Prime formula would be such an insane idea that I'd actually love to see. Instead, Jet Fusion is a 3D action platformer that draws inspiration from quite a few different iconic series in the 3D platformer genre. Drawing from Jimmy's boy genius roots, Chrome Studios made creating inventions a significant part of the game. In every level you play, there will be plenty of components scattered about. When you collect all of them, Jimmy creates a new weapon he can use to take down enemies, and they also double as a way to remove obstacles and solve puzzles. The inventions don't end there though. Every level also contains a second set of components. These form an invention that deals with some sort of roadblock, preventing Jimmy from traveling to the next level. If it seems like there's a lot of things to collect, that's because there is. I've really only scratched the surface. Batteries are scattered about, which are used to control Goddard. His most common use is the shield, which is activated by pressing Z on the GameCube. It obviously comes in handy when it looks like you're about to take damage, but the shield will also reflect some attacks and is the only way to take down certain enemy types. Goddard also can be controlled via something the game refers to as the Play Dead mode. Kind of a strange name considering Goddard is not playing dead. I guess it's named that because when you stop controlling him or direct him into an object, he explodes. Poor dog. Using any of these abilities is tied to the battery level, which drains pretty quickly, but this is easily compensated by the fact that batteries are everywhere. One of the earliest frustrations I noticed in Jet Fusion is that the game runs on a live system. You run around with a certain amount of lives and when they're depleted, you get a game over. This doesn't seem like a big issue at first because the game will just respawn you at your last checkpoint, but then you'll notice that the game is also running a continues system as well. While the game doesn't make you start from the beginning if you run out of continues, it does make you restart the level you're currently on. I just find this so unnecessary. Scrap the lives and just respawn me at the last checkpoint. Adding all this extra fluff makes the game worse than it should be. Following the same structure as Jet Fusion on the GBA, the levels here are grouped into different themes, all of which were present in the handheld version. 
each level is impressively large compared to the Nick 3D platformers we've played so far. Games often go this route, but the levels end up being empty and boring, but Chrome Studio's obsession with collectibles actually fills out the level nicely. There are so many nooks and crannies to discover, filled with invention components and batteries or a bunch of other collectibles or pickups I haven't even mentioned yet. There's collectibles that unlock art and videos, one-ups, and nav chips. Nav chips are a weird mechanic. Each level has a random amount of these, and the game's explanation of what they do is a little confusing. Based on the way the game introduced them, it seemed to me like you had to collect all nav chips to advance to the next level. I quickly discovered this wasn't the case, leaving me baffled as to what they actually do. It wasn't until much later, while randomly researching the game online, that I learned of their use. Apparently collecting all of them in a level allows you to skip the next level. This is a really strange idea and left me with more questions than answers actually. How does this work in conjunction with the unlocking of weapons and stuff? What the hell happens if I skip a level where I unlock one of the weapons that are required to solve a puzzle later on? Either the function of the nav chips is misreported online, or the game will hit you with clunky as hell roadblocks. With over half a dozen collectibles, Jet Fusion rarely goes longer than 30 seconds without you picking up something. It's strange, but I honestly liked it. The loop of constantly grabbing new things were hitting the right spot with my endorphins. But as levels got more complex and difficult, I was constantly in fear of missing an invention part, getting to the end, and then hitting a massive roadblock. It made the game slip from being a fun collectathon to a tedious task of staring at the game's minimap at all times. Naturally, to get to all of these collectibles, you have to do a lot of platforming. Overall, the game is pretty light on the platforming side of things, definitely playing up the combat much more. When you do come to sections of the game where platforming is the focus, you get the sense that this mechanic was undercooked. The decision to forego a double jump is a little confusing. It feels like the game was ripe for this, but instead Jimmy has just a basic jump that makes platforming a bit of a chore. Arriving at the jungle level's platforming section just massively exposes Jet Fusion's jumping. Going through this was a slog and brutally unforgiving. If I'd played through this as a kid, this would have been one of those infamous levels that I would have nightmares about. Combat is clearly where Chrome Studios put most of their focus, something you could probably tell by the fact they dedicated a lot of the collecting towards giving you new weapons. Pretty much every enemy in the game has one specific weakness, forcing the player to discover which weapon will work. The same thing applies to breaking certain objects too. This is a normal video game thing, but the problem here is that an enemy's specific weakness is never well communicated. There's no rhyme or reason to the weaknesses of a lot of enemies, forcing the player to just do unintuitive trial and error. Heck, some enemies just seem to not have any weaknesses at all. In this case, I'd just use the fan gun to blow them off platforms to their death. Goodbye. And in general, the weapons needed extra polish. Combat feels far too unsatisfying considering you spend most of the game locked into it. Maybe it's because I've just completed Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart, which has some of the most satisfying combat in history, I found using the tools in Jimmy's arsenal was so lackluster. Speaking of Ratchet & Clank, Jet Fusion seems to be massively inspired by two franchises created by Insomniac Games. The constant treadmill of new inventions and weapons, as well as the combat focus, gave off serious Ratchet & Clank vibes. I was also getting massive OG Spyro vibes from the game too, particularly with the little mini games scattered in each level that deviate from the standard gameplay. Every time I'd find myself in a sumo match, kart race, or flying around as Goddard, my mind drifted to the PS1 Spyro trilogy. Those are massively iconic series to be drawing from, but I genuinely think they do a good job taking these design ideas a lot of the time. It never comes close to the heights of those games, but it manages to carve out its own neat little style of gameplay by combining the two franchises. One thing you've most likely noticed by now is that this game has a widescreen mode on the GameCube. According to one source I found, only 73 games supported a native widescreen mode on GameCube, Interestingly, the Powerpuff Girls Relish Rampage was one of these games. However, none of the sources I looked at listed Jet Fusion, so who knows how accurate it is and how many GameCube titles truly utilize this. Visually though, the game is up and down. I hated the character models. 
They're incredibly ugly when the spotlight is really on them in cutscenes, and the animations are liable to do some really bizarre stuff. Goddard also talks in this game, which I found weird. Like, Goddard probably has the most lines of dialogue in this game. Holding the action button will let you push or pull objects. It's not necessarily bad, but it caught me off guard. It's even stranger that every kid in the tutorial level sounds like Meatwad from Aqua Teen Hunger Force. This no man of no time. I'd say I've been mostly positive about Jet Fusion on home consoles so far. The game is far from perfect, but it was doing enough things right to be enjoyable. However, it's really a game of two halves. Once it hit the halfway point, my enjoyment dropped dramatically. It really started with the intense platforming sections in the jungle and escalated from there. The main issue is that Chrome Studios abandons what made the game enjoyable. The fun, combat-focused collectathon gets tossed aside for platforming and a random minigame being thrown at you every 5 minutes. The Spyro-style minigames are a fun, occasional breather early on, but the further you get into the game, the more they lean on these to pad out levels. It's like they weren't confident that players would enjoy the basic gameplay loop they created, so they tossed in as many minigames and gameplay change-ups as possible. Whether you're doing the world's slowest and most boring minecart section, or shimmying along ropes while avoiding seagulls, Jet Fusion pretty much drops everything that made it a fun game. My breaking point was this out of nowhere fishing game. This comes at a point where you've just done the seagull minigame section multiple times, and have had to drive through a jet ski course. It's just too much. On top of that, I could not get the mechanics of this to work. I was supposed to reel in this fish to grab an invention part, but no matter what I did, it wouldn't work. Without a password system or any documented working cheats for me to brush past this, I was stuck. The game had drained any motivation I had left to play through to the end anyway. I have no idea what was going through the developers' minds when making the second half of the game. It honestly plays like it was made by a completely different studio to the first half. This game is so close to being a fun little Ratchet & Clank style clone. Instead, it drops the ball halfway through and becomes a chore to play, abandoning all its strengths in favour of clunky gameplay. I was ready to sing Jet Fusion's praises from the top of a mountain, but by the end I was ready to never think about this game ever again. Jimmy Neutron Jet Fusion on home consoles is possibly the biggest disappointment of any Nickelodeon game I've played so far. No, it's not the worst game, far from it actually, but it squanders so much potential that is so evident in the first hour or two of the game. It abandons what makes the game a fun experience in favour of things that are god awful. It embraces the Spyro style minigames way too much when they'd already found success with being a bit of a Ratchet and Clank clone. On the flip side, Jet Fusion on the GBA nails this. It wants to be a beginner level Metroidvania and sticks to it. It's a super unique idea for a Nickelodeon game and it executes it superbly. I would highly recommend the GBA game, but would caution anybody tempted to play the PS2 or GameCube game. Maybe you can stomach the bizarre gameplay decisions later in the game better than I can. If that's the case, you'll probably love Jet Fusion. Next time, we'll be looking at one of the most unique franchises in Nickelodeon history. I'll be covering TAC and the power of Juju for both home consoles and the GBA. TAC is so unique because it's a Nickelodeon property that got its start in video games rather than a movie or on TV. The TAC and the power of Juju TV show wouldn't debut until 2007 and it was a pretty big flop from what I can tell. Prior to that, there had already been three TAC games released, and he made appearances in Nicktoon's Freeze Frame Frenzy and Attack of the Toybots. It's honestly a fascinating strategy from Nickelodeon. To make sure you catch my review of TAC's debut, hit the subscribe button.